everyone, welcome to Loop Law. A quick deep dive into a folklore topic where I share some of the stories from around the world that have piqued my interest. It's no secret here on Loot Law that we face the cold, hard truth that nature is out to kill us, and definitely will if we let it. With that, we turn to the skies, bringing you fearsome flying folklore threatening to strike your friends and family from above. Remain indoors! Nature is outside and it's waiting for us. Is it a bird? Oh, oh yeah, that's a big bird. I figure I have a mostly North American audience at this point, so I thought I'd begin close to your home with the Native American Thunderbird. Now, to an extent, the Thunderbird has morphed into some sort of cryptid for the modern times. Yet this is no simple monster bird. All tribes with Thunderbird traditions seem to acknowledge an aspect of divinity. The Thunderbird is the archetypal god of thunder that happens to be a giant bird. They can whip their wings to create a crack of thunder, and can call down lightning. In some stories, straight up shooting lightning from their eyes, just in case you wanted to try and call coincidence over divinity. Stories of the Thunderbird seem to align roughly with tribes we've talked about before, who also share Wendigo folklore. The Algonquian of the Northeast, along with Algonquian-speaking people such as the Ojibwe, down to the Iroquois people surrounding the Great Lakes, plus a few more besides including the Menomini, Ho-Chunk, and Suwan. As a divine spirit of the skies, the Thunderbird sure run quite far across the north of America. Incredibly important in native traditions, it envisions speaking to greatness in war if someone who was fasting saw visions of the Thunderbird, and also as a divine figure fighting back the spirits of the underworld, so the earth below the domain remains safe for the tribe's people. It feels incredibly uncomfortable that the Thunderbird is kind of accepted as a sort of big bird out there to be discovered by cryptid hunters that the natives must have just mistook for being more significant than it really is. Keep an eye out for the stories of only the smoking boots of a cryptid hunter being found. That should help with the divinity question of a Thunderbird. Slavic Nightmare Fuel for Pregnant Women Ah, the Paroniac. This is not a nice one. That should be obvious from it being Slavic folklore. Slavic folklore does not mess around. This is a traditional, yet strange by contemporary standards, version of a vampire that comes out of the Poland area. Which fits. Poland weirdly seems to be the birthplace of vampires as we know them. But the Peroniak is very different to what we do know as vampires now. Any time during pregnancy, up until six weeks after a baby is born, a traditional benchmark of personhood for that area, should tragedy befall the pregnancy or the newborn, then the remains must be carefully disposed of properly. If not, then something dark and spiteful could be formed from those remains. This story really is not a pleasant one. Should a Peroniac form, you now have a disturbing winged creature that lurks in the trees, waiting for pregnant women and the newborn to feed upon. These creatures are made powerful as a dark inversion of all the potential life now not lived, and I don't know about you, but that sounds worryingly strong. Sadly, there's not that much more information readily available about the Peroniac. As with a lot of traditional Euro-Slavic folklore, it eventually got astroturfed by Christianity, and this went from a tale of taking care of pregnant women and newborns, with special care to be given to those sadly lost. It just ended up being a get baptized or else story. The concept is getting a dark fantasy revival thanks to the Peroniac being one of many Slavic folktales being adapted by the Witcher franchise. So, modern day novels, games, and now television will feature a version of this quite worrying creature. Very big birds over on the other side of the planet, too. This was a big one I missed out on my Monsters and Myth folklore, that being The Rock. R O C, not beloved actor Dwayne Johnson, an immense bird of mythology that is said to be able to carry away an elephant. The rock, or rook, was pretty simple really. It was an incredibly sized bird of prey that was a legend of the Middle East. Its tail spreading globally with the popularity of the Thousand and One Nights, where they are included as a part of the tales. The rock only has a very small mention of the tales themselves, Abderrahman the Moor's Tale of the Rock Egg only being a couple of paragraphs, but it obviously made an impact. Merchants travelling the China Seas come across an island and decide to land to look for fresh supplies. Upon exploring the island, they find the giant egg, which they attack with axes and rocks and sticks. Eventually, they manage to crack the shell and pull out the gestating rock chick, 
itself being massive. A feather, the largest one they could find on the not quite fully formed chick, was torn off of the body, and then as much meat as they could carry is carved off. Then, as they are leaving the island, at some point, Mama Rock returns. While they escape through the night, Mama came looking in the new dawn. So massive, it seemed like a giant cloud was heading right for them from the island. Angry Mama turns out to be bigger than the ship, and had picked up their phonetic namesake in a giant chunk of mountain they then tried to drop on the fleeing ship. The merchant sailors somehow luckily slip away, thanking God for the providence. Uh, the huge rock may not have been able to safely go close to the water, and the good winds they sailed under carried them well beyond the stones being dropped over them. The way that rock is treated in this short tale seems to imply it was a common part of folklore in the area. There wasn't much time put into describing or explaining the creature. It feels a lot like a story from Europe would be if it was an anecdote along the lines of we stole from a dragon, then ran the hell away. The dragon doesn't need context, we know what one is. The quill torn from the chick they killed was Abderrahman the Moor's proof of the tale, said to be big enough to hold a flagon of water, but there was another part of the story. Of all the crew who ate of the flesh of the chick they managed to get away with, anyone who went to sleep with grey hair woke up with the hair colour of their youth restored. This has a worrying implication for why there are no more rock around. There's nothing quite like the vanity of rich men, and to have some measure of your vitality restored would have rock eggs hunted into oblivion in a very short space of time. Who likes floating glowing guts? Okay, here's one I haven't encountered much, but has definitely stood out quite remarkably whenever I have stumbled across it. The Krausu, a kind of spirit found in Southeast Asia. It starts of the head of a beautiful young woman. So far, so nice. Sometimes it has fangs, sometimes sharp teeth, still not too bad. But then there's what's going on below the neck. The Krausu ends at the neck. Below that is some dangling organs and intestines. It just kind of floats along like a weird glowing jellyfish made out of gore. Can you imagine walking along a fence, a shy looking beautiful woman walking just the other side? taking on a strange glow in the moonlight, just bobbing along with you until the fence runs out, and all that's there beneath the floating head is a heart and some dangling glowing guts before the pretty head turns towards you, revealing their fangs. I'm very sad to say that I for one can imagine this. There is a lot of regional variations of this particular spirit. It's all across Southeast Asia with other names it has, including Ap, Palisic, Penangal, Kuyang, Layak, Popo, Peikang, and Salak Metam. Sorry if I got any of those wrong. Sometimes witchcraft or dark pacts are involved, sometimes tragedies, other times punishments for moral failings. Modern movie depictions have muddied the water even further, adding various embellishments to tell a feature length story. There are some common aspects to worry about, plus some unnerving details. Their exposed intestines and digestional tract hint to their gluttonous nature. While not in all regions, there are stories of them seeking out fresh blood, but for the most part they seem attracted to disgusting things. Rotting meat, festering garbage, feces, especially anything riddled with maggots. After enjoying their feast of filth, they then like to wipe their mouths, which has led to a tradition of not leaving washing hanging overnight as you run the risk of finding bloody filth smeared all over your formerly clean laundry by a gleeful Krausu fresh from a waste ditch. Small yet simple moral of the story here? Keep everything clean and tidy. You may attract pests, and some pests may be supernatural and extra disturbing in nature. More Mythological Menaces I seem to have caught a monsters and myth bug after dedicating a whole episode to them, so let's get additionally Harryhausen classic and look at the harpies of ancient Greece. Harpies have something of a bad rap now in the modern world, their name being an insult for a mean-spirited woman, and often used as a synonym for ugly, but as ever the full story is a lot broader than the insults we now yell at each other. They are another chimeric creature of myth, being composed in part of the aspects of a woman and the rest a great bird. Not rock-sized great, but in proportion with what is usually the torso and head of a woman, for what is still some substantial sized talons. Early depictions of them on pottery tend to show a beautiful woman, but they ended up described like vultures in later epic poetry, 
and that seems to have warped their appearance to being more hag-like over time. They were seen as wind spirits, their name vaguely analogous to being swift robbers. Or snatchers, simply. Should someone suddenly vanish one day, a common phrase would be that they were taken by the harpies. Even at their furthest and best, these tales are wary of the harpies carrying victims away. That they got described more and more foul and vile over time really hammers home that this is a suitable entry for the Death From Above episode. They are sometimes referred to as the Hounds of Zeus, which fits in then with them being spirits of the air, and their most famous tale making use of them got an awe-inspiring rendition in the classic Jason and the Argonauts movie. The King of Thrace was gifted a talent of prophecy by Zeus, but they managed to enrage Zeus by using this gift to meddle with the games of the gods. The Harpies were then set upon King Phineas, carrying him away to an island to be tormented for turning his gift back against Zeus. Each day a grand banquet would appear, and the Harpies would then harass King Phineas away from that food, eating what they wanted before fouling all over the rest, leaving him to get by with what was unspoiled scraps he could manage to scrounge off the floor around the banquet table. Zeus did not mess around once he caught a grudge. The Argonauts on their journey rescued the King of Thrace from his fate to get guidance on the best route they needed to take. King Phineas ended up a playing piece in this particular game of the gods, and winning his freedom as a part of playing in it to the satisfaction of Zeus, or else the other gods who would wager on the game that could then keep Zeus to the terms of the escape. Something about harpies definitely resonated far beyond the borders of ancient Greece. They made it through the medieval times as a relatively common depiction in tapestries, through to a modern use of their name as an insult, Despite how relatively simple they are compared to a lot of monsters of myth, the simplicity may be the appeal I guess. They've got an iconic story to rest their appeal upon, and a lot of wider spread smaller depictions, all the way up to being pretty iconic themselves. Quite a lot of people would know what a harpy was if you asked them. That's all for this episode, Wanda has already covered the rather disturbing Peroniac in her Dark Art series, and there's always more every Friday so we could be seeing others from this show soon. If you want to contact me there's the show's dedicated email, lukelawgsg at gmail.com, and the general show email, ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. Both myself and the main show are really easy to find on Facebook and Twitter if you want to make day to day contact as well as a very active Instagram account a lot of the community gets involved with. The Luke Law Instagram is quite slow to post, but I would chalk it up as easy to follow for now. I'll have it way more active once I can get out and about and get some photos to put on it. If you want to support the show directly, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys. It'll get you access to all sorts of GSG goodies at different tiers, my incentive being that Luke Law episodes go out to patrons a month early. As ever though, the absolute best thing anyone can do to support this show is to give it a listen. Share this around if you think you may know someone who might be interested, leave a review if you get the chance to help signal boost me, and most of all, I simply hope you enjoy what I'm doing here. Goodbye for now. <laughs>